good? Okay. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. We're thankful uh, for another opportunity. Jordan and Megan, I think we mentioned this morning her friend, um, her sister died this week, so they're going over to the showing today. So we appreciate that he was able to help us this morning, and we're thankful for that. And uh, some other people are traveling. Some people, I don't know where they're at, but the Lord, one thing for sure, the Lord always knows where you're at. This, this evening, I'm, after service, I'm going to travel to Chicago. Uh, we're going to have services at Chicago all next week. But, uh, and I thought, you know, sometimes it's, it's easy to, um, um, you could leave a little early and, you know, stuff like that. But I, and I thought, you know, I don't really want to miss service to be in service. It kind of, it doesn't help too much. And, and, and I'm not talking about any, anything, you know, but it's, because I remember one time I went up there on Sunday afternoon um, because I had a flight the next day. But, you know, there's something about being in the house of the Lord with God's people. And it doesn't take a lot of people. Uh, you can actually sit outside by yourself and the presence of God comes. So we're just trusting that he will come and be with us tonight and that he'll have something for us. Amen. Rick said, well, I, we figure you're going to be on the road and... Uh, so you probably won't preach very long. I, well, who knows? <laughs> we'll see. But uh, we'll sing a few songs, and then we'll get looking to the Word of God. But we're thankful for everybody that makes the effort to come. Uh, it means something to us. It was quarter till five. I looked at looked at my watch, and I said, I am the only one here. I think and maybe did we announce we're having service tonight? <laughs> but here we are. So let's stand together, and we'll look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we truly are thankful, Lord, for your many blessings upon our life. Lord, for the brothers and sisters, Lord, their faithfulness. I pray, O oh God, that you would just bless them for this, O oh God. Lord, how gracious you are and kind. Lord, you have given us this place, Lord, a roof over our head. Lord, you have kept us, Lord, and you watched over us. Lord, when we look around us, Lord, there are so many people that we know, Lord, that Lord, that they walked with you for a season, and um, then they've left. Lord, when we look at ourselves, we see nothing outstanding in us that would merit us staying even longer. Lord, we, we just know it's your grace. Plain and simple, that's all it is. It is a, your grace. So we thank you and we bless you. We just ask that you be with us in the service tonight. Anoint thy word, and we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Lord and Savior. Amen. driving back, so I don't know if they've already started or what, I don't know, but I know they're on their way up here. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a 
joining together because there's something in them they just don't feel comfortable in a denominational system or a church that really doesn't preach the truth they um, and I've talked to people like this they would call you and say Basically, what am, what am I going to do? There isn't anyone down here or where I'm at that really preaches what I believe. And excuse me if I'm going to put something in my mouth because I still have this cough. Um, and I think it was mentioned last week that one time Brother Branham said, well, you know, find the best you can. And some people can feel comfortable with that, but other people, it just, they just are, they just need the Word of God. And they make choices um, that some people may not understand, but um, God knows what's going on. And um, what may work for one person doesn't work for someone else. Um, So we pray that God would just meet them where they're at. And hopefully by sometimes sharing what we have, um, they can receive a little bit of something. There's a scripture we'll start with tonight. And Evan, we did not turn on the, uh, that's all right, the television. Will it mess you up if you turn it on now? Can you do that or not? Um, There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 21, and it says this, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. What do we understand? The, the man that death came by was in Adam. And in Adam we were all made sinners. And we all received a curse upon our life that we are going to die. But by Jesus Christ, he brought the resurrection from the dead, an opportunity for us to live forever. I'll wait for you. You might have to start that over. I should have I should have just not mentioned it. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Well, the storm is here. Okay.
Yep, we're good. When we finish up this morning, we mentioned what it said last week uh, was about the three stages of the first resurrection. And in that, I was asked the question, would it be possible to kind of lay it out on a timeline? And um, I thought we would do that and put the scriptures to it. Many of these scriptures were mentioned last week, but hopefully by kind of reviewing what, what we've been taught and putting it in this way, it'll be easier for people to understand it. The scriptures were, that go along with this, and what, what we're looking at tonight is the first phase of the first resurrection. This actually took place, if you want to say it, within, um, if you want to call it the Old Testament period, it was before the beginning of the grace age, before the church was formed, because the church was formed on the day of Pentecost. This would happen after the resurrection, or at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First scripture up there is Matthew chapter 27, and verses 52 and 53, and we will read these scriptures. It says, The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. We've got to understand this resurrection was not like the times when Jesus would walk around and, and rise up somebody from the dead. Uh, Lazarus, a little girl one time, when, when Jesus would raise those people from the dead, they raised up in a mortal body and they were going to die again. It's, it's, it's just a matter of time. Uh, who knows how long Lazarus um, uh, lived? Um, but um, the person's going to die again. They're in a mortal body. But this resurrection, it is speaking of um, a resurrection to immortality. It is the Old Testament saints. While we mentioned this morning, they were in a place called Abraham's bosom or a place in paradise. They rose up out of that place, and for a short season of time, they appeared to the saints in and around Jerusalem. Uh, the scripture that goes with that is Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 8 and 9. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. When you talk about captivity, really it's talking about the souls that were in that position at that time in Abraham's bosom. They were set free from that because Jesus now has conquered the power of death. He is able. He has the keys of hell and death. He's able to set them free. It says, Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? So what happened is when Jesus died on the cross, the, the, and, and this is important too, um, to understand this, like we said this morning, he did not lose consciousness. Um, there's just no consciousness in, in the body. The body goes into the grave, but Jesus descends down into a place where there are spirits, <coughs> spirits the souls of man, that are um, very, re re very able to recognize what has taken place. He declares unto them that this is the fulfillment of the promise. And when he rises again, we've got to understand this, because sometimes in Matthew, um, it doesn't really, the time frame doesn't look, at, look exactly like this. But Jesus Christ was the first one to raise again. Because it talks about the veil of the temple being rent um, and, the, and the graves being opened. But it's when Jesus Christ rises from the dead that the other come, come up with him. 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verses 15 to 18, we want to bring in with this first resurrection also. And it says this, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. When you look at this scripture, you have to understand what Paul's looking at and what's taking place at this time. 
He said we got to rightly divide the word of truth. So what we're doing today is really doing what Paul said. We got to put the scriptures in their proper places. This scripture will fit here and this scripture will fit there because to put them in the proper places, to put the pieces of the puzzle together, then you'll get a proper understanding of what the picture we're looking at. Now these two men, they're preaching a doctrine and, and, um, and what their doctrine is, the resurrection is past. Well, what would make these men make a statement like this? Well, they've heard the, they've heard the stories, no doubt. Maybe, who knows, they could have experienced this. Yeah. But what happened is when the resurrection takes place here, they, they recognize the resurrection has taken place. So the, te- the, the story at this time is, is, hey, the resurrection has happened. But then, what do you do now when people start dying again? Well, if they're wicked, maybe there's not a problem. But what happens when somebody that you consider a, fa- a saint of God would die? Well, what are you going to do with this? If the resurrection's over, then there's no hope for those people. And this is why it says that they would overthrow the faith of some people. Because the people really have no answer. Because we know a resurrection taking place. And we know, uh, or we don't know, what else to look at. That's why Paul would come along in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 13, and he would write to them this. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. When he talks about the, those which are asleep, he's not looking at the Old Testament dispensation. Those that are asleep, Paul's only looking at the ones that have died since the resurrection up into their hour of time. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So what Paul was saying don't worry. And see, Paul understands this hour of the grace age. What Paul was saying here to the saints in Thessalonica, because no doubt they've heard this, this question. They, they have the same question. What happens to a person that dies after the resurrection? He said, don't worry. When, or basically, we could put it this way, there is coming another phase to the resurrection. And when that other phase comes, everybody that has died from the first one to the second one, they will raise up also. And God will bring them with him. Amen? Then when we go to this next one, we had a picture this morning, and we asked the question about basically what would happen to a person when a person would pass away. Uh, When a person would pass away, They were fully conscious. They went down to a place, either was called a place of torment or a place of comfort, Abraham's bosom or hell itself. Uh, We mentioned this scripture this morning. We'll read it tonight. That way, if you're taking notes, you can put it down. It's in Psalms 146 in verses 1 and 2. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. And then in verse 4 it says this, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In the very day his thoughts perish. When a person takes that, and really what they're doing again is they're taking something out of context. When they take this scripture at this, it sounds like that when you're dead, you are Dead. Well, I guess when you're dead, you are dead. But, but what they're trying to do is they're missing this other realm about the separation from God. Paul, he would say this in Philippians chapter 1 in verse 23. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. So the Apostle Paul had this understanding that if he left this earthly body, 
that he would immediately be in the presence of God. I read this when I was re looking up some notes and stuff, and I thought it was good. It says, many Christians have a wrong view of death. We think we're going from the land of the living to the land of dying. But the opposite is true. We are going from the land of dying to the land of living. Amen? Amen. Christians have always faced death with confidence. The very word cemetery comes from a Greek word meaning sleeping place. So they understood when they put the, put the bodies in the grave that they were only there for a little season of time. This refers to their confidence in the promise of the resurrections. And then I, I read this. Many pagans cremated their dead because they saw no further use for the human body. Well, some of them believed in an afterlife, but they didn't really believe in this resurrection like this. People have asked me, Brother Tim, what do you think about cremation? Personally, I don't care for it. And the reason being because of this reason. The Jewish people, they buried their dead. The pagans, they, uh, they burnt their dead. Is cremation wrong? Um, I, I wouldn't say it's wrong because let me tell you this. There was a lot of Christians that were burned at the stake and, and God will have no problem putting them back together at the resurrection. For me, it's just a personal uh, preference. So if the Lord takes me from this world and you have anything to do with the plans, um, you know my preference. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and um, verse 1. Yeah, we don't have these scriptures up here, but you can write them down. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Verse 6 says this, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And then in verse 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You know what that, you know what that, you understand what that's saying? Paul understands this. If we leave this earthly body, we are present with the Lord. Amen? Now, uh, and we'll, we'll mention this in, for the message sake. Brother Branham had a question, and his question was this. If I would die, um, what, what form would I take? Because he understood, and, this is, and th you have to understand this, we are going to live in a resurrected body. Amen? Uh, all of Christianity is based on the fact of the resurrection. Paul said this, if there's no resurrection, we might as well just go home. Because what we're teaching is not even true. So the whole gospel is built around a physical resurrection. If this body doesn't come back, then I am reincarnated. Understand that? If I get another body, then it's reincarnation. But he doesn't speak of reincarnation. It's resurrection. This body is going to come up. It's just coming up in a better model, a newer one. Um. When Brother Branham asked the question, he kind of said this, will I be like just a, a little cloud, you know, like a spirit just floating around waiting for the body to be raised again? But then the Lord gave him a vision, and when he stepped into that other realm, what he saw was is, is people. And people was walking around, and they were shaking hands, and they were hugging each other, and he said it was a wonderful place. They were human beings, but he also made this statement, there was no sexual desire in that place where a man could hug a woman, a woman could hug a man, and there was nothing unseemly going on. Brother Branham comes back, and then you can notice it in his messages. He starts talking, and he uses this term, a theophany body. Well, a theophany body, mankind will never have a theophany body because the very terminology, theophany, Theophany means a, a visible manifestation of the invisible God. Well, we're not God. So only God can have a theophany. It's, it's broke down that way. But what we will have, and this is really what Brother Brandon was looking at, we will have a, a 
glor- not a glorified, but a, a, a heavenly body that we will step into. And he just called it theophany. So when you're reading Brother Branham, you can understand what he's talking about without trying to make some new doctrine out of it. And that's what people are trying to do. They made this doctrine out of theophany body. I had a man tell me one time, oh, I got a phone call. I think it was from my theophany. It's like it's a, like in heaven right now, there is a body waiting for me. But you know what he said? If this earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, in other words, if I die, then I will be transported into a form, but that form is not God's goal for our life. The th- uh, I see if we would use his term, a theophany body is not his goal. His goal is a glorified body. And we will step into that at the resurrection. When it says those that are with Christ will come with him, so right now they are in a heavenly place. If, you've, if we take Brother Rick's mom, Sister Irene, she's in a heavenly place now, and she has a form. If you could, if you could leave this life, step into that realm, you would see her as a young Irene Stewart. Um, but what will happen at the second coming, she will leave that place, travel back to pick up this earthly body. It'll be resurrected. Hey, do you really believe bodies are going to be resurrected? Well, what, remember what it says, the graves were open. These bodies are coming up. And I'm not saying the graves are open like you're going to walk by a graveyard and see a bunch of open graves. What it is is the body's no longer held in that grave. So the person comes back, so that is God's goal, is that you would live in a glorified body. And the reason we're going to live in a glorified body, because this, we were never created to live in heaven. Anybody want to say amen? You were created to live here on earth. And when God restores everything back to where it needs to be, your final home will be here on earth. Um, Throughout eternity? Yes. Uh, One more scripture that Paul would bring in. 1 Thessalonians 5.10. Well, I guess we're kind of in the... Yeah. Um, Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, to kind of explain what's on this chart, in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6, it says this, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. So John saw the throne in heaven, and we understand the one that's sitting upon the throne is um, the Lord Jesus Christ. I like what Brother Stroman mentioned last week when he looked in Daniel chapter 12. Not not chapter 12. I forget exactly. Maybe 2 or something. But anyway, he talked about the Ancient of Days. And he also talked about the one that was coming and given a kingdom. It's really kind of the same picture that we see in these scriptures in Revelation. In Revelation, there is one sitting on the throne. But then the Lamb comes to take the scroll It's not showing us two different people because we know it's Jesus is the lamb and Jesus is the one on the throne. It really is to show us that the one on the throne is really Jesus clothed with the power of Almighty God. He is the Ancient of Days. He is the Eternal One. But it is not through his power that he's able to open the book, but by his sacrifice. And what we see in the old, in the book of Daniel, is this one that is portrayed as the ancient of days, but also the one that is the son of David, this picture. But in this picture, we see him sitting on a throne, and before him there is a sea of glass like in the crystal. What we understand when you look around this throne, you see people there. Amen? This is going back to the thought, does a person live after they, they, they pass this mortal realm? Obviously, somebody is because they're in that dimension at that time. The picture on the left comes from Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. 
I tell you, this is a, a beautiful truth. And I think about it, Brother Dean, since we came into this, we've known these things. But there was a time when the saints of God really did not know what this fifth seal was talking about. There came a time, though, when God pulled back the, the, the page and let us look into this. And what was when Brother Branham stood up there and said, these are Jews. Amen? And what Jews was he looking at? He's looking at the people that came out of the Holocaust. Well, what's happened to the people that's come out of the Holocaust? They're not laying in a grave unconscious. They are actually in a dimension, and in that dimension, they are crying out to God, How long, Lord, until you judge and avenge our blood? He told them, You will wait yet for a little season until your fellow servants and brethren. In other words, somebody, in other words, what he's saying, there's coming another Holocaust. Yes. And you will wait for what? You will wait for me to execute judgment upon the people that have done this to you until after they've fulfilled their whole purpose. So here we see another picture, a dimension within heaven, and the souls there of these Jewish people, and they are, they are referred to as under the altar. What we have come to understand is this. If you look right here, this may be the Holocaust saints. But if you trace it all the way back, you can trace it all the way back, um, really, to 33 A.D. If there was a Jew that looked to the promises of God and believed in a coming Messiah, he would be in that picture. Amen? All of them. So, let me also say this. If you were a Jew that rejected Jesus Christ, could you be there? Well, it's according to if God reveals him to you or not. Because the Jews, they reject Jesus. That's why when Brother Jackson was asked the question, can a Jew make it to heaven? His answer was no, they rejected Jesus, and Jesus is the only way to heaven. Well, and this is what we have to understand <coughs> We become responsible when God reveals himself to us. Amen? Who knows what's going on inside of man? We really don't. The ones that stood there and screamed, crucify him, crucify him, I don't think they didn't have their opportunity. Jesus Christ was in flesh before them, to show them an opportunity. But who knows about everybody else, what their, what their condition is. But Paul did say this in the book of Hebrews. If a Jewish person would recognize Christ and follow Christianity for a season, he said, if after you've been illuminated, if you've come to this understanding, if you would turn around and go back to the wall, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Do you know what he's saying there? You can't go back. Because now you're guilty. Because, you know what, isn't there a scripture that says, now, he said, now that you say I see, there is no cloak for your sin. In other words, because, and the scripture said this, God has blinded them for a season. So down through the course of time, what God is, what does it mean that he's blinded them? Basically this, those dark sayings of old, those sayings about the church, he just closed their eyes to it. They can read, you know, it's like the, Philly, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Remember what, what he asked? Is the prophet writing about himself or someone else? You know, he was wounded for our transgressions. Who's he talking about? See, they really didn't understand that. But once they understand, they become responsible and they will have to come into another group. That's what, and, and that's really what happened in that first church. Multitudes of Jews would become Christians because of what they believed. But you see this group, but then you come over here and you see this other group 
And I like the description of this because it gives you a little bit more insight. Um, in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, uh, we'll read this. And then we've got one more scripture to read as far as this is concerned. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindred and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So we see a great multitude of people, and they're standing before the throne. And what we understand also before the throne is where the sea of glass is. And what the sea of glass speaks of is faith. But this is a group, a, a, a tremendous multitude. But then when we come to Revelation 15, it gives us a little bit more insight. Revelation 15 and verse 2. Um, and I saw, a, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. Uh, what does the mingle with fire talk about? It's talking about a fiery persecution that these people would come through. What it's really talking about is a people that would come through the great tribulation period. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. When we see this picture now, um, this is in the latter part of Daniel's, or yeah, Daniel's 70th week. And what he sees on this sea of glass, people coming out of great tribulation, it's Jews and Gentiles both. Amen? But when we look at Revelation chapter 7, it's only Gentiles. John did not recognize these people. What we can see here on this sea of glass, people coming out of tribulation, what people said is recognized this is the Gentile foolish virgins. This is the question that was raised. If there is a rapture of a church, why do we see the church in the Great Tribulation? And this comes back to rightly dividing the Word of God, uh, understanding it. So what people do is they, and they read the book of Revelation and they say, hey, the church is in the Tribulation period. That means, and what they've come to the conclusion, there is no rapture. Because some people's teaching this rapture that we'll be caught out of here before the tribulation, and it's not true. We've got to go through the tribulation. But there's another scripture that says God has not appointed us to wrath. What is the wrath of God? It is the great tribulation. But because they don't see the entirety of the scriptures, they're not able to put the pieces of the puzzles together, they just say the church has to go through the great tribulation. Let me tell you this. There is a church that will go through. Really, there's a couple churches that will go through the Great Tribulation. There is Mystery Babylon the Great, because this is false religion. It will go through the Great Tribulation to be, be under the wrath and judgment of God. But also what we recognize, and we can tie this into Matthew chapter 25, that these people called foolish virgins. Foolish virgins were someone that was lacking the oil. And what is the oil? It is the, and this is important, it is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because remember, there was oil, they had oil, remember? Because their vessels went out. They just did not have what it took to carry them through this season of time. So God allows us to understand that there is really within Christianity, there is a false Christianity, there is the bride of Christ, and there is also these other people that never really went all the way. They, they felt an anointing. They received something from God, but they were never sealed. Because let me tell you this. If you're sealed with the Holy Ghost, if you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the rapture, you go. And the rapture will take place before the great tribulation ever sets in. But if you're lacking this, then you will go through the great tribulation and have the opportunity to die. Will they all be martyred? Hey, who knows? Because at this period of time, not only will there be a great persecution against Christians, a great martyrdom, but also there's all kinds of sicknesses and diseases that are let loose upon mankind. There's a lot, there's a lot of ways to die in that period of time. 
And then Brother Jackson would make this statement, and it's, very, and it's absolutely the truth. When the Bible says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Then is the Laodicean church age. Then is the hour of time that we have, that we have lived in. Then it says, it, because it's then when there was a shout. And when the shout came, it separated these two kinds of people, the wise and foolish virgins. But let me ask you this. If this is the Holocaust Jews, and we recognize that down through time there's been people just like them. If this is the trib tribulation saints, the or, or we want to say that this is the foolish virgins, can't we recognize even though they're not called foolish virgins, there's always been a people like that. Anybody want to say amen? You understand what I'm saying? So you have to be in the Holocaust to be a Holocaust saint. You have to be in Laodicea to be a foolish virgin, but there's always been that kind of people. So down through time, and really what it did is allow us to see God's grace and mercy. Down through time, there's always been a kind of people that, that looked to God but never really received the fullness of what God had to do with him. And then people started to say this, well, you know, then this person's foolish. You know, that's foolishness. Don't try to pick out foolish virgins. And I will say this also, straight in the gate as narrow is the way, and few there be that find it, the eternal life. Don't make the multitudes of Christianity um, foolish virgins. God sees that. He knows what's going on. And, and the Bible really tells us that the multitudes of people are going the way of destruction. So it brings us a picture of these different uh, dimensions, different realms in heaven of people that are waiting for um, their resurrected body. When we look at the second phase of the resurrection, what we understand, we put it right in this period of time, right at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. For many years, I've heard people preach that the man of sin could not come on the scene until the rapture of the church has taken place. In other words, it's like we are here that's holding back him coming on the scene. Hey, it's not the fact that we are here. It's the fact that God is still calling out a church. As long as God is filling people with the Holy Ghost to make them a part of the bride of Christ, he will not allow that man of sin to come on the scene. The hour is not yet. Because when he comes on the scene and it opens up Daniel 70's week, that le we understand this. God has turned the page. The ge Gentiles have been cut off and the gospel given back to the Jewish people. But once the church has been completed, there is a season of time before the rapture takes place. In this season, remember last week, Brother Stroman, uh, and some of that were in the Bible studies, heard it when he talked about the judgment of the living. Also, when he talked about uh, the seven thunders, the judgment of the living, the seven thunders, the sevenfold anointing, all these things take place as the church age, the last person has come into it. The door has been shut to that opportunity, and it happens in this season of time between this closing and the rapture of the church. Um, this rapture is a mysterious time, but we understand it has to be right around the first part of the week. The Bible specifically says this. That day, in 2 Thessalonians, and I'm not sure, no, we don't have it there. We might have it on the next one. That day will not come until the man of sin is revealed. So we can see this, that the rapture will take place sometime around the closing of the grace age and the opening of Daniel's 70th week. Because I don't believe these things are miles apart. Um, they're kind of moving together. Um, and we understand that we are gone before the great tribulation. Amen? You understand that? So how far do we move into that? God knows. Amen? 
Um, God only knows. And um, if you go, I, well, it's up, up here, Luke 17, 34. It says this, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. This is talking about the secret catching away of the bride of Christ. You know what that means? Um, two people walking side by side. One can be filled with the Holy Ghost and one is not. What it does show me this is, Brother Dean, it's not like some people have they figured it you know what, they, they remember this date in 1988 is the rapture of the church. Ain't nobody going to sleep. If I told you tonight, God has told me that the rapture will take place tonight, um, well, you'd probably all think I was crazy and leave. But if you believe me, would anybody leave church? Oh, no. We ain't going nowhere. We are going, you know, you know what? You'd be worse than a kid on Christmas Eve. How, how could you get to sleep if you believe that Jesus Christ is coming today? But this is really showing you this. We will know it's a season, but we will still be walking in this world. That you, because, you know, sometimes they make it like, you know, we're going to know this and know this. But this is really showing you that we're going to be walking in this world, and then mysteriously, he's going to take this person, take that person, and you know what, they, when they make the movies, it's like all the Christians are gone. Or most of the Christians are gone. Um, it's not that way. Because most of the Christians are in denominational systems bound up by traditions. Uh, another realm is the foolish virgin. Let me tell you this. When the rapture of the church takes place, in this resurrection... And this is important. And this resurrection is only for the bride of Christ. You understand that? So if you're not in the bride of Christ, will you come up or you'll be left? Let me tell you this also. If you're in that realm of food or foolish or ones that are in the white robe category throughout this age of grace, they don't come up there either. There's another resurrection for them. This resurrection is for the bride of Christ. Why is he calling us to heaven? Because there's going to be a marriage supper. And we're going to be caught up to be with the Lord and enter into the marriage supper. Um, so, and also let me say this. When the rapture of the church takes place, don't expect all the babies in the world to be delivered out of here. Amen? Um, that's what people, you know, in the movies... Every baby's disappeared. Every baby's disappeared. Hey, there'll be a lot of babies in the Great Tribulation. There were a lot of babies in Egypt. There was a lot of babies. You know what? Noah didn't build an ark big enough to take all the babies. And I'm not discounting something. Don't try to make me say something. I'm not telling you these babies are all wicked, and that's why they're left. They're just not called to that position. They're not going to. God is not going to empty this world of babies. When he led the children of Israel out of Egypt, this is important to think, no. When he led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he did not take all the babies out of Egypt. Actually, what he did is leave behind a lot of dead babies. And when they went into the promised land, he never had them save all the babies. They killed everybody in the promised land. Understand what I'm saying. I'm not talking about all these, all these babies in Egypt or in the flood or something, that all of them went, perished and went to hell. But what I'm saying is they all perished. Under, you understand what I'm talking about? When he takes the rapture, he will take the people. Uh, myself, personally, if somebody wanted to argue with it, that you could argue with it. If Olivia and Jonah's got a little baby at this time, I don't believe that they go into rapture and he leaves the baby here alone. I mean, it's just not the picture I see in the scripture. If somebody want to argue with me, um, I'm not going to argue back. But you understand what I'm saying? 
That's the, that's the pattern that I see in the scripture. Remember this, though. Not everybody that perishes, um, perishes without life. Some people perish and that they still have life. Um, so this is a mysterious catching away. And people say this. Um, there is, the rapture cannot be found in the Bible. That is true. If you get your concordance out and you look for the word rapture, it's not there. But the rapture is a, te- is a, is a term meaning the catching away, and the catching away is in the Bible. Um, to be honest with you, there are no English words in the, in the original Bible. So the translators choose a word to best fit this. Um, in Philippians chapter 3, the next, ver- the next verse, verses 20 and 21, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this is what the Bible says, we shall be changed. This body, um, this body won't fall by the wayside and I will ascend to heaven. This body will be changed. I see some, you saw, I've not seen many of these movies, but you see clips from them and things where all of a sudden the rapture is taking place and, and the person sitting on an airplane in the seat next, of them, next to him has the clothes left. I don't think this. I don't think we're going, if you're changed, I don't think you're going to leave your clothes behind. God is going to transform this, this person. Your clothing, it'll, it, you, it, it all changes. Um, and it says, he will change our vile body. It's a body that's going to decay and make it unto his glorious body. Remember what Jesus said when he, when he rose from the dead? Touch me. See that I'm a man. Somebody said, well, the Bible said flesh and blood shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Maybe Jesus didn't have blood. That's not what he's talking about at all. When he says flesh and blood shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven, you will never do it on your own works. You'll never do it in a fleshly way. It'll always be in a spiritual way. But when we are transformed, hey, flesh, blood, bones, you will be a person in a glorified body. Mark chapter 13 and verse 32 It says this, but at that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. What day is he talking about? He's talking about the rapture of the church. He's talking about this day. Because let me tell you this, once we enter into Daniel's 70th week, when we start the countdown till the end of the week, you can count days. He is very specific in the time that he's given to Israel. And this is, this is important to understand. Jesus, when he came, he said, if you could only know the time of your visitation, it was the time appointed of God in prophecy that the Messiah had to be on the earth. No doubt that's why some were looking for the Messiah. But when they asked Jesus about, his, um, about this, that day and that hour, he's not pointing to the end of that, He's not pointing to the end of the tribulation period. He's talking about the secret's coming. And Jesus will take, her, take his church away. And what Jesus says is, I don't even know that. The Father himself has kept that in his own power. When Brother Branham talked about the seven thunders, he said, I do not know what they are. I just believe this. They have something to do with the one thing that Jesus himself said he did not even know. It's the rapture of the church. So something in the seven thunders brings us to the point of the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1, it says this, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destructions come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. 
But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. In verse 6, it says, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So somebody can say, well, if we don't know when the rapture is, um, do we even have to be aware? The purpose of the shout was to awaken us to the fact that a rapture is going to take place. It was to awaken us up, to make us uh, very aware of the hour we live in. So now there are many things that made us aware that we are living. We understand this. We are in the seventh church age. We don't know how long the seventh church age will last, but we do know this. There is not an eighth church age. This is the last one. We know Israel has been brought back to the land for a purpose. We don't know how long until she gets her temple back, how long until the prophets come on the scene, but we know that she is back to receive a message from those prophets. So what he says is because we understand those things, we should not get careless in our walk. But then, Sister Pauline, I can ask this question. Why so many people careless? You know, it's not just the world that says, where is the promise of his coming? It's Christianity. I believe this. Now, I know there are people that are traveling this weekend. But some people that could be here are not here because they do not understand the seriousness of the hour we live in. You know what they'll tell you? Brother Tim... I've heard you preach for 30 years about how serious it is. So I've got time to play around a little bit. Let me ask you, do you really? Are we in here just because, you know, we like to have something to do on a Sunday night? Seriously. You have to ask yourself, what are people thinking? How many people really will be caught caught unaware just because they never listen to the warning from God? Careless. And let me say this. If you're careless, people's watching you. Amen? And if they see your careless attitude, you, you, you know, there's people, you're praying for your loved ones. Oh, I want them to come in. But then they see you and they don't see, they see somebody that's careless. I read this before. There's a lot of people, Christian people or church-going people, that are converting to Islam. And you know why? Those people are sincere. Because what they're seeing in those people is not what they're seeing in Christianity. What they're seeing in Christianity is a church that's gone to sleep. See, the reason Jesus Christ hasn't come back is because he's long-suffering. He's waiting on somebody. Hey, maybe he's waiting on the prodigal son to turn something around. Maybe he's waiting for somebody to come in. But you know, the Bible said it's high time that we woke up and we understood the seriousness of the hour we live in. Uh, We face eternity. Verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. What are we watching? We're watching the signs of the times, the scriptures, how the two of them. You know what? When you look into the back past, Brother Dean, you can see history and, and the Bible lie together. And prophecy is really the history in the Bible just telling us before it, before it becomes history. One day it too will be history and we'll see where it and the Bible lined up. Verse 9, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So 
Salvation is deliverance. He is going to deliver us from this world of sin. Um, staying with the second phase of the second resurrection, I wanted to bring in, I was putting four scriptures up on the chart, but then these other ones, I really thought I'd like to bring them in too. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 15 to 17 says this, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The dead in Christ, remember what we said back here in the first phase of the first resurrection, took care of the Old Testament saints. The dead in Christ is everyone that would die from this point going forward until the rapture of the church. When he says we shall not prevent them, it's really what it, we could say this, we will not precede them. You will not be resurrected before them. The dead in Christ come up, they take on, they take on uh, their, their mortal body, or, or really now it's going to be a glorified body, and we, our body is changed. And then he says, as a group, we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So Jesus Christ will be there in the air. The spirits of those people will come down to the bodies. Our spirits are already in our bodies. and There will be a transformation take place, and then we will be caught up to be with the Lord. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 51 to 54. Behold, I show you a mystery. In this mystery, because in this age of grace, when we're talking about the mystery of God, within this age of grace, there are a lot of mysterious things, mysteries that are folded into the the main mystery. The, this mystery he's talking about is really the climax of this hour of time. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. You can take this and tie it in with 1 Thessalonians. Not everybody's going to die. Somebody's going to be alive. I know this. My, I think, Lord. See, Paul, he made a statement. I am in torn between two things. Um, I long to be with the Lord, <coughs> but I also desire to stay here because it helps people. And myself, I tell you, I really would like to go into rapture. But how many, pe how many people that's in the grave now, they said the same thing. Oh, my. You know, I think Brother Jackson, when he talked about the scriptures he saw to be fulfilled in Israel, man, he wanted to see those things so bad. But it wasn't his portion. Um, I want to do this. I don't want to make a mistake where God has to take me off the scene. I don't want to sit down where he says, there's no, there's no purpose for you anymore. Because let me tell you this, if there's a purpose for you, he will keep you together. Amen? As long as there's a purpose for you, he will keep you here on this earth. Oh, so Brother Tim, you're saying everybody that's dead, there's no purpose for them. Well, I'm telling you this, they fulfilled their purpose. Amen? It's not saying anything negative about anybody. But I am saying this, if I would sit down and quit following the Lord, then he really has no purpose left in me. He might as well take me on home. I want to make the rapture because my, it's going to be such a glorious event. Well, you know what? If I'm in the grave, I'm going to make the rapture anyway. It's not that. You know what? I have witnessed to people and I've talked to them and I think if I can make the rapture, um, they will know it. The, whole, the world as a whole, they won't understand what takes place. But I think there's people in my family, I think maybe it will speak to them. And I have no desire to let them know, see, 
I was right after all. What I have a desire for, because of this, and we came to this understanding, at one time, this is what was taught. Once the grace age is over, if you're a Gentile, you have no hope. But now we understand this. There's hope for the Gentiles and the Jews in Daniel's 70th week. What I hope is that when I'm gone, God will use my leaving to speak to him. That's why I want to make it. I mean, more than anything, I want to make it for that fact. I've got family, I think this. They, they think, think maybe I'm too fanatical or maybe, you know, basically what they're, they're going to church, but they're saying we don't have to live like him. You know, that stuff's not necessary. You know, you don't have to live that dedicated to be okay. And I'm hoping to some of those people it will make them step back and think about what they're doing. I can tell you this. When we first got married, it was in 1979, and um, got saved just a few months later. And at that point in time, we got saved, got filled with the Holy Ghost, and now we are excited, and we hear about a rapture of the church. In a Catholic church, you don't hear these kind of things. But I hear about a rapture of the church, and I'm excited, and I'm seeing that we're in the last days. So you know what we did? In our living room, when you walk into a living room, there was a stand there, and in that stand, Sandy might remember it, we put a big Bible there in the stand, and we put a note in the stand, in, in the Bible. And you know what the note did? It was instructions for people, because we was believing this. One of these days, you're going to come in here, we're going to be gone, we want you to know where we're at. So there are instructions in there that if we're gone in this mysterious way, there is a rapture of the church, we're gone, and that this is what you need to do. Oh, man. We was flat on fire. Um, oh, my. I want to be that kind of person. To live a life that one day, and you know what? People disappear all the time. And the church may not be that big a, big a thing. Somewhere they'll be able to excuse this day. But to some people, I think they'll stop. I think it was one of my kids one time. You know what they did? They called me. No answer. Send me a text. No answer. Trying to get hold of me. No answer. And then they said, oh, man. Dad always answers his phone. You know what? I don't think they stopped to think. You know, one of these days, Dad could die, and um, there ain't going to be nobody at home to answer the phone. But they started thinking about, ooh. And you know what? I remember one of them told me. Let's call Sandy. Because if Tim's gone that way, Sandy will be gone too. So we want to see if we can get hold of her. Hey, don't you want that kind of testimony? Somebody would say this, surely if the rapture takes place, that they will be gone. I remember I saw a video one time and there was a, some people in a church and everything, and all of a sudden it was a, like a thun. And uh, I think the preacher was actually preaching, and he said, I'll tell you, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and all of a sudden, and his Bible falls to the ground. He's gone, and they look around, and there's like a half a dozen people left in church. Man, I tell you what, that would freak you out. <laughs> Oh, could you imagine that? You're sitting here, you're not paying much attention, but then all of a sudden you lift your head up out of Facebook or whatever you're doing and uh, everybody's gone. Man, you know, when you talk about it, you can kind of laugh. That would be terrifying because you know what's ahead of you. Brother Dean, it's what you dreamed of. To enter into a dark tribulation period. Oh, my, how hor horrible, because you know that's coming. 
If this takes place, you know that's coming. I tell you, I saw this other thing where, where the preacher, he was one of the few people in his church that was left. Wouldn't that be something? Because we know many will say, Lord, I didn't I do this and I didn't I do that. He said, you know, I never knew you. Oh, how horrible. In a moment, verse 52, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, I tell you, like that. We're changed. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Brother Gary, I used to like when he said, this is just an old pest house. Hey, this is corruptible. It decays, it fades away. But in a moment, it is restored to its youth. Oh my, what a day. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Let me tell you this, death still hurts for the ones on this side. But when you cross over, death has no power and what is the power of death? It's the fear of death that had power over our lives. Um, and I like this in Isaiah 26 and verse 20 and 21. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. God has given us a word that will hide us away during the great tribulation. We are not appointed unto wrath. We are not the church that goes through that period of time. Because actually when you read the scripture, while the great tribulation is raging on the earth, the marriage supper of the Lamb is taking place in heaven this period of time. Okay, we're going to try to bring this to a close. Um, we've got more, but I'm kind of looking at the time. and We want to finish up the first resurrection. Um, and then at another time we'll go into the second resurrection. We can catch that in another service. It would take too much time. When you look at Revelation 15, Revelation 6, and Revelation 7, um, these things we've always already mentioned when we talked about the souls under the altar, and the foolish virgins. These scriptures here, and if you want to write these down, and like I said, I will send these charts to you if you want, these all deal with this kind of people. I asked Brother Stroman outside of service. I don't know that I've ever heard anybody really say it. I felt it myself. Um, but... I thought, I just want to make sure I'm looking at the same thing he's looking at. When you look at Revelation 15, 7, and 6, and we talk about a people, some of this is talking about the Great Tribulation, but we also understand that throughout the Age of Grace, there have been these ones. Brother Jackson used the term white robe saints. He talked about the Bride of Christ being arrayed in fine linen and these people being in white robes. And I asked him this question, if you lived in this period of time and died and you were a white-robed saint, would you come up in the second phase of the first resurrection when the rapture takes place or would you come up in the third phase of the resurrection? His answer was the third phase. So if... I don't want to put a name on anyone, but um, if I... I'll use myself. If I'm a foolish virgin 
if I've never been filled with the Holy Ghost, um, but God has saw something in me that he has granted me uh, eternal life. Because remember what he told the souls under the altar? White robes were given unto them. The white robes signifies his righteousness. And in his righteousness is eternal life. See, we have to be clothed in his righteousness to have eternal life. Otherwise, we perish. So white robes were given unto them. What we see in Revelation 7 is the same thing. These people were clothed in white robes. So if I am one of those people, and I would die tonight, then um, I would have eternal life. But when the rapture takes place, and you people, some of you are changed. Well, let me say this. Dean is filled with the Holy Ghost. He's part of the bride of Christ. I'm not. Um, something in me has come up short, but still God is going to have mercy on me and give me eternal life. Sandy, um, Sandy's filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, I die tonight. <coughs> Brother Dean dies tonight. When the rapture takes place, Brother Dean would rise up, Sandy would be changed, they would be caught up together, and I would not come out of the grave. You understand what I'm saying? Raise your hand, wave at me, understand what I'm saying? Now, where am I? Well, I'm not in hell. I'm in a heavenly realm, right? Because that's what we saw. These people were in a heavenly realm. They're just not in an immortal body because this resurrection is for, for the people that are baptized with the Holy Ghost. It is, and let me tell you this, it's not like some people say that the baptism of the Holy Ghost was lost until Azusa Street. That was the gift and the manifestation. There's always been a people that had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Always has been. That's what makes you part of the bride of Christ. He is bringing them out of, the bo out of the grave because they're going to be caught up into a heavenly realm where they will be prepared for their position in the millennium. Uh, and that's the marriage supper of the Lamb. The judgment seat of Christ will take place in heaven. Well, we're being judged right now. Uh, not only is there a judgment of the living to come, we're judged every time we come into church. Amen? Judgment begins at the house of God. Um, but I would not come up at this period of time. But it doesn't mean, because let me tell you, because I've done, I, I, I've followed God up to a point, it doesn't mean that I have no portion in the millennial kingdom. I'm just not part of the bride of Christ. So what would happen, and, and I hope you understand, this is only an illustration. <laughs> I just didn't want to put somebody else in this bad position. Well, what happens is we come to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 and 6. And this is what it says. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. Who's the they? Well, and if we go back to our illustration, it's Dean and Sandy. Dean has died, been resurrected to an immortal body, Sandy has been changed into a mortal body. Now, they come back with Jesus in Revelation chapter 19. He's getting ready to set up the kingdom. They are on thrones with him. Remember what the promise to the overcomer was? To him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. What is the throne? It's the throne of David. So they are there upon thrones. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and when they had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's where I would come up. I will reign with Christ a thousand years in that period. So what we can do is, come here a minute, Jonah. When we talk about those that never take the mark of the beast, that's this picture in Revelation 15. But remember what I said? There's people back in this farther in the picture that's really the same kind of people. White robe, they're not the bride of Christ, but they have been given eternal life. So when you see this in Revelation chapter 20, these people are resurrected at this time, but also these people are resurrected. 
and they all fit under this category. And what the scripture says, they will reign, live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Uh, will I be the same as Dean and Sandy if I would come to that point? No, I would not be. But I would still have eternal life, and I would still have a position in the millennial kingdom. Okay, you can be seated. And this is something else that Brother Strowman was stressing, the fact of there is something takes place in our life here that is preparing us for a kingdom to come. What is it? It's the responsibility, the revelation that's been placed before us. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. The second death is here, and we'll get that into this in the next message. The second death is exactly here at the end of the millennial kingdom. When he says this, the second death has no power. There will be nobody thrown out of this resurrection. If you're, when, when you read in the Bible, when you read of a judgment that takes place and some people make it and some people are thrown out, that is not the judgment of um, pe um, spiritual people or heavenly people. It is a judgment of earthly people because if we make it in this resurrection, everybody will have eternal life. There is no one in the first resurrection that is lost. Everyone that has a body, and everybody will have a body in that period of time, and they will all have eternal life. I hope this helps. If you want to stand together, we will close for tonight. Like I said, and you can write those other scriptures down if you want. And, uh, we don't have a lot more, but I feel like this is a good place to bring it to a close. Uh, what we'll do tonight, uh, we'll just all come up together and we will have a word of prayer before we close. Do you know how to do that, Mary? Okay. And Evan, you can go ahead and prepare to, you can shut off the YouTube and